this, this is a list of uh, just the molecules that we have seen in the gaseous state. And most of these are at millimeter wavelengths and infrared wavelengths. Uh, this graph was taken uh, from Buckley, Morvan, and Bay in 2017, but you also see it incorporated in other talks. Uh, these are the molecules written on the side. Uh, at the top is water, but if you look underneath, uh, you see the top two carbon-bearing molecules, which are carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And you can see uh, the relative percent or relative amounts with respect to, to water here. And then some other ones you get are methane, uh, acetylene, uh, ethane, and, and so forth going down there. So these are the ones that we see the most of in comets. And what I'm presenting to you here in this table is just, OK, what do we see if we take all comets as a group and uh, just see what the variation or what the average numbers are? In reality, Comet to comet, there is some variation. Uh, some of them are very rich in CO, some are very poor in CO, and we, we do some, see some variation in uh, other molecules, which I'll, I'll show you uh, next year. Uh, first, I want to caution you that you know comets do move. And so as we're looking, like you look at this figure here over to the left as a, a guide here, if we have a comet coming here, say, from the scattered disk or so, and coming in, as it gets closer to the sun, it heats up, and different molecules start sublimating or are released. Some molecules are actually produced from photochemistry in the coma. Mm -hmm. And so the relative amounts, when you're looking at, you know, well, what is the amount of CO to methane? You almost want to, you really want to ask, well, where were you when you took this measurement? Uh, if you know anything about comets, you're familiar with this plot on the right. Uh, we call that the Christmas tree plot. And this is from uh, Nicholas Bivet's work on Comet Hale-Bopp almost, well, actually more than 20 years ago. Uh, sorry it's so small here, but I think you can see these different lines here are different molecules. The top one where I have the cursor, the top of the tree is OH, the tracer of water. And the one just below that, the sort of green one, on, at least on my screen, the second one, is CO. And right away you can see that those two have different relative and you can see other variation in there. And this horizontal axis goes out to about 10 AU there for comparison. So some of these molecules are like OH are daughter products. They're formed by way of reactions of what we call parent molecules. And the parent molecules are what we think came off the nucleus, either as sublimating as an ice or uh, a trapped gas in the water matrix. So this is a, I like this picture just to get you all thinking along the, the right lines why we need chemists in this field. Uh, the little nugget in the center is a comet. And you can see uh, the white lines are supposed to be molecules that actually sublimate it off, for example, CO, CO2, um, methane, methanol. But then if you look a little bit further out, some of those uh, undergo photodissociation, photoionization, uh, can have uh, collisions, other ways to create some of these other molecules. And if you notice down here in the lower right, uh, CO is, can be a parent and a daughter. So you have to be careful. And we had uh, really nice talks in the last session that cautioned us about different ways you can make CO2. Uh, the, what the technique that I use the most, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that more in depth, is millimeter wave spectroscopy. Uh, I like it for two reasons. One is it's a good way of identifying what's there and how much of it is there. But it's also a good technique for getting at some of the details on how it came off. And it's really hard when you're doing remote sensing and just pointing in the general direction of the comet to tell how this material is coming off and whether it's likely to be a daughter product or uh, a parent product. So this is a, one of the dishes in telescope in Arizona. It's a 12 meters dish. They're usually quite quite big. Uh, and over here on the right is a sample spectra of methanol, as it happens. Uh, these are three different uh, transitions. And uh, you can identify them there. And if you want integrate under the curve, you can get uh, do some uh, non-trivial excitation calculations. You can get 
production rates for those. So I'll call them densities and then production rates. Here's an example of how you can get more than just abundances. Now these are two spectral lines of a comet uh, known as, uh, I used to call it schwassmann vachmann one so that's a mouthful and it's hard to Google. Uh, 29P is a lot easier to track <laughs> and uh, that's, that's its, its short uh, period name. So it's a 29th uh, named short period comet. Uh, or some orbital studies have this categorized as a centaur, an object which may be in transition from Kuiper belt to short period orbit. It's in a circular orbit right now. It's always active. I don't care when you want to look. If you need a comet, this is the one for you. It will always be active, at least if you only want CO. Uh, it's very difficult to see anything else right now. Uh, occasionally uh, some N2, well, actually some CO plus or N2 plus. So this is uh, intensity, y-axis, x-axis is uh, units you might not normally see in spectroscopy unless you're in millimeter, which is velocity. So instead of wavelength or frequency, we just converted everything over to velocity space. Uh, so if you were at zero kilometers per second where this uh, cursor is, that's the speed that the comet has according to our ephemeris. And the molecules should be coming off with that speed, if they're traveling at the comet speed. And, and what we see is that there's actually a complicated structure to the velocity profile. And we're working with uh, Mike Comby with his uh, detailed model of Comby and how molecules behave in the atmosphere once they're, if I can call it an atmosphere, once they're emitted from the nucleus. Uh, he is able to fit to the spectral line depending on how what the temperature and velocity he picks. So we could actually constrain information about the coma this way. Uh, a point that is often missed about millimeter wave spectroscopy is that it can be really high spectral resolution. We can sometimes get down to 0 0.05, 0 0.08 kilometers per second per channel uh, resolution, which really gets you a good window into the, the coma. Uh, in the optical, gosh, I don't even know what that is. It's really, really fat lines there. Uh, but we can and get down there. So this one is telling us that this is, and this is work that was initiated by uh, Gunnarsson and all uh, their model and others showed that it fit very well with the two component uh, model where you have something coming off on the sunward side, which is the hottest part of the nucleus, and then perhaps an extended source um, or at least a, a symmetric source. Here are two other molecules that uh, show what you can do with uh, millimeter wave spectroscopy if you have a high enough spectral resolution. This is hale -Bopp. Uh This is at about 5 AU, so Jupiter's distance. And the CO is at the top, and we have methanol at the bottom. Uh, here I have a, a, a line drawn where the centered speed velocity is for the comet. And if you look closely, you can see that the CO is actually a little bit off to the left of that line, which shows that it's a little bit blue shifted. Uh, and then that's all that we see with that particular time. Down below, the methanol is much fatter, it's centered, it's more consistent with, for example, uh, coming off with uh, heated icy grain halo uh, for hail bomb. Now remember, this is 5 AU, this is uh, too far away for water ice to sublimate very efficiently. Uh, so we're spending a lot of effort trying to understand how, how these comets uh, became, become so, active. But the CO might be like a jet? It could be a jet or just an active area on the sunward side. Okay, but it, it, it's not as broad. Right, it's okay. more localized. Yeah, okay. So what do the abundances of uh, carbon species tell us about the comets? I try to make this as big as possible. <laughs> the, the short answer is it's complicated. Uh, let me guide you through this. On the left hand in the, the different colors over here are the names of individual comets. And the colors, if you can see them, actually tell you what group that comet belongs to. Uh, group A, uh, this is uh, from a paper that came out pretty recently from uh, Neil De La Russo and, and his colleagues. 
Uh, so you can, I do recommend you go and stare at it and try to digest that. These groups, they're not necessarily orbital classification groups. They're more focused on what do we see that the chemistry is telling us. So if you want to go there and try it yourself and try sorting to see where it is, now's your chance. Um, this, this paper has gone through, it, it kind of, to me this looks like what I see in March when it's basketball season and <laughs> yeah. the playoffs, and I'm not really sure who won. Um, but uh, you can look down, if you, you know, seriously, you can look down and see which comets are rich, known to be rich by observation in the hydrocarbon in CO, which ones are known to be poor in hydrocarbon in CO. It's kind of, I just picked those two as an example. The, there are a dozen, a dozen or so molecules are represented here. Uh, it's, it's difficult to, um, we haven't distilled this to an exact answer. But what do we find here? Uh, one thing is, uh, you know, what we want to know is, well, this workshop is about the carbon. So what do the carbon species say? Do they show any uh, agreement between abundances and the or orbital classifications that comets seem to be following now? Uh, the one thing is that the data seem to be fairly clear that carbon chain molecules, simple ones like C2 and C3, which you can see in the optical, optical spectra, they appear depleted in Jupiter family comets compared to other comets, such as long period comets. Uh, and that's been pretty well established for 20 some odd years, probably longer than that. It is a little less clear but we might be making ground on that with other molecules like CO, methane, acetylene, ethane. They may be depleted in Jupiter family comets, as uh, Neil De La Russo and all discuss in their paper. But I'm going to say we need more data. I don't, I don't want to give you the idea that all Jupiter family comets are depleted in this. In fact, some are actually enriched in CO and other molecules. So it's really... Uh, not entirely clear what's going on. If you look at the CO and CO2 abundance, abundance ratio, we have potentially a lot to learn there because remember they're among the two most abundant molecules, carbon mo two, well, in the top three to begin with on average. And if you ex ignore water, they are the top two. Um, there are also two molecules that the abundance ratio you tie back to some of those chemical models of protostellar nebulae that are um, diagnostic of conditions that may have existed. So there's a lot of reasons to look at that. Uh, the abundance ratios suggest that instead of coming down hard on the side of Jupiter family comets formed here and other long, fam long period comets formed there, but they best interpretation is that they probably formed an inner overlapping regions uh, between the CO and CO2 snow line. And I didn't put down exactly where those snow lines are in the solar nebula. Uh, it depends on which model you're looking at, uh, but I think if I remember right, 5 to 10 AU or maybe it's 3 to 7 AU. Someone else can weigh in here. It depends on when you're, you're doing this and which model you're following. And also there's uh, this paper from Ahern et al. It goes into great detail about how they think CO2 may have formed from CO on grain surfaces. And that needs to be taken into account. I'd like to point out that distant comets are a useful niche in this field. I'm going to define that as 3AU, but it's really whatever distance from the sun a comet is not sublimating water ice very well. One reason I like it is because the water ice is not sublimating very well. Mm -hmm. It's turned off. And now you can see, you, just, you eliminate one of the hugest variables in the modeling. You can look at, at what else is coming out. Now with hale Bob, you also got things, people were seeing methanol and formaldehyde. But a lot of times you only really see, you're only seeing CO and CO2, uh, such as a lot of studies in the infrared with space telescope and uh, ground-based studies as well. So it's a chance to, to study just those alone, kind of isolate them. Uh, if we're lucky, sometimes we get to see a comet that is 
sublimating so far from the sun that even CO2 is not likely to be sublimated. We have one of those right now, C2017 K2. Now, CO has not been detected in it, uh, but you'll see uh, recent papers from Karen Meach and Dave Jewett saying it's probably what's actually behind the activity. And so that's a chance if you really want, for the modelers who really want to study the CO outgassing, there's a comet that might just be the one to really focus on. And uh, also distant comets provide opportunities to test models of chemical reactions between CO and CO2 in grains and comey. So I do think we need a lot more observations for that. Uh, this table here is just a reminder, maybe I should have put it in sooner, of the sublimation temperatures of various cometary species. Uh, the species are on the left, N2, CO, methane, and, and then on the right we have the temperature in, in Kelvin, and uh, this is not an absolute. In, in reality, the temperatures depend very much so on the likely densities and pressures you have going, but uh, CO is over here at the lowest possible temperatures, and this purple line in the middle is uh, CO2. So that's what we're thinking is, is driving a lot of the activity of distant comets. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on uh, with my group, and this is uh, work carried out by Olga Harrington-Pinto, graduate student uh, at USF, uh, she's looking at data from a lot of these studies, uh, Bauer, Reach, Utsubu, and also some of her own data for CO uh, and uh, some things that are published elsewhere, to look at the ratio of CO to, well, the gas to dust ratio determined with CO over what we call AF rho, which is a measure of the dust production from, hopefully, from spectral determinations of the continuum gives you an idea of how much the dust is coming out of the comet. And, and that's the top plot. And then the bottom plot is CO2, so the ratio of CO2 to dust, uh, just to see very crudely how much is coming off. Now, the points that are up here uh, are different comets. Uh, the, a lot of the ones in CO here are actually for hale bopp but there are half a dozen other comets up there. So we're just trying to look collectively. One of the things that, that Olga has noticed is that if you look at the CO line, it definitely increases, the amount of CO to dust increases as you get closer to the sun, but it, it does seem to, that there might be a break that happens at around 8 AU. Uh, and this is something that Bauer et al. kind of hint at and po point out with some of their studies of CO2 to epsilon ephro, which is a, a infrared measure of, of the dust and we're looking at it in more depth. One thing I want to point out is that the CO2 appears to be a, a different steepness to the production rate, and it tends, it's hard to tell. There aren't a lot of data points here, but it may be hinting that it's breaking at 4AU instead of 8AU, and maybe you're seeing CO2 driving a different behavior than CO if it's dominant. And just really starting out with this, uh, we do need more data, especially out here at the further distances. And uh, another thing, fun thing you can do with uh, CO and distant comets, this is looking in particular at centaurs, which are those uh, objects on unstable orbits, presumably en route from uh, somewhere in the Kuiper belt to becoming an uh, orbit closer to a, a short period Jupiter family comet. And this line drawn in the middle in black is the amount of CO per surface area of hale bopp as a function of heliocentric distance. Now, hale bopp is not a centaur, right? But it's handy in that we do have measurements of this comet at the heliocentric range. And just to compare it to hale bopp without making any bigger claims uh, beyond that, we're just trying to see what's going on. Um, so we have, we call this specific production rate. It's just the production production rate per surface area. And you can only do this for objects you have the diameter that you know the size of. You have a pretty good idea for it. We see that a lot of the large centaurs appear to be, I don't know, depleted might be too big a word, but they're certainly producing a lot less CO than uh, hale bopp and other, other comets. Uh, maybe a hint to what's going on. We, 
possible the CO could be there and it's just trapped and not able to come out. But some of these distances are pretty close to the sun. Uh, if they're near the surface they, of the nucleus, it should be uh, able to escape. So that's something else, another trick you can do with CO. And uh, this is uh, kind of next steps for CO and CO2, uh, where what I think might be important, especially for this workshop, no surprise, we need more CO observations. It is very difficult to get CO in comets for a wide variety of reasons. One is it has a low dipole moment. So it's difficult to excite in the radio. It would help to have it over a wide range of heliocentric distances and beyond 5 AU so we could start to, to explore how it's driving the activity of distant comets. Also need to get simultaneous measurements of CO2 and CO. And I'm not going to say any more about that because I know Adam McKay is going to talk about that. Uh, and we need to reanalyze some of the, uh, how we get when we look at CO and CO2 in infrared band passes such as Spitzer or Neowise, the red band and the blue band down here, show you what the wavelength range from about four to five microns, uh, and then this first band is CO, this, you know, drawing of CO2 here, and then the second one is where CO is. For a lot of the spacecraft data, they just assumed it was all CO2, but a few of them, like 29P was in that category, we know it, it's prolific with it CO, uh, so we know some of those were, were CO, but it, I think we could do even a better job of trying to separate the CO and CO2 in the, the, the bands of Spitzer and Neowise. And then finally, yes, we too can do great things with JWST. Uh, for one thing, we get, get spectra at these wavelengths. And also ALMA with the, the interferometer, uh, mil, millimeter wave interferometry, we could even tell more about what is going on when stuff is coming off the nucleus and expanding or escaping. Other. And that concludes my talk. Great. Thank you. Who has questions? Diane Wooden has something. Can you see that? 29P shows a 10 times range in the production rate plot. Yes. May some CO be coming off icy grains in the coma or just off the nucleus? Yes, I, I didn't mention that, but yeah, the CO, I, I said this comet is always releasing CO. Sometimes it, it's outbursting and goes up dramatically by a factor of three or, or even seven to nine. And yeah, that, that is a possibility that it could be doing that. Um, we and other people are looking at it. Hey, uh, Maria, this is Mike, the Santi. Hey, very nice talk. Uh, I actually wanted to uh, to go back to something you said about um, depleted uh, volatiles in Jupiter family comets. Yes. And in particular, yeah, the uh, the hypervolatiles, as we call them, the CO and and methane, uh, are not a whole lot is known about them, and literally you can count on one hand the measurements uh, in Jupiter family comets uh, of each one of those. And some of those are upper limits, three sigma upper limits. And yeah, so. We actually are up to two hands now in our group. So. Yeah, that, well, that actually could be, yeah, the, yeah, in terms of CO, that's true. And that, I was thinking more of methane in particular because that, that was even more sparse. Yes. And that's uh, from remote sensing from the ground. Methane is actually more difficult than CO because the uh, opaque nature of the telluric lines uh, is more severe uh, in terms of uh, needing a Doppler shift to shift you out of the opaque core into the wings or better yet into the continuum if you can get that high a velocity. But yeah, and, and I think for the other hydrocarbons, I think you had acetylene and ethane mentioned there too. There are others, of course, but I think they, in general, are a bit lower in JFCs than in uh, long period, you know, nearly isotropic comets from the Oort cloud in yes. general. But there, there, at least there have been more measurements of them. Yes. Anyway, that was, a, that was a great point. Yeah, 
Um, yeah. um, let's see. The yeah, one thing I'll say too is that just as an aside is that the the millimeter work and submillimeter work is very highly complementary to the infrared in that you get the um, velocity resolution, uh, whereas in the infrared we don't resolve the lines because our our resolution is typically you know uh, six to ten kilometers per second, which is way beyond the, the width, the, the Doppler width. And, and that separate, that velocity, velocity resolution helps us tremendously in that we, we often right. fact, not, never have to worry about telluric really uh, yep. conflicting with ours. It's always well separated. Thank you. Thank you. So I was oh. interested, if, can you go back a few slides when you were talking about um, the uh, kind of trying to pull out uh, the formation location of these bodies based on um, what kind of gases are coming off. Okay, which slide? I think that? it was that one. Okay. The, the, that right. is, right. all right. Or maybe it was the next one. Okay, well, that's not this what this group, one is trying to do. Yeah, but although this is grouping yep. for orbital characteristics, is that right? No, orbital those, characteristics versus... It, I think there's mention just, of the orbital. Uh, I just pulled up the paper, and that's yeah. only chemical composition yeah. characteristics. There's no orbital characteristics. Oh, I thought I thought that the colors were the different. Groups, no, they're not groups. the orbital oh. taxonomy. It is looking at chemical families. Okay. Yeah, actually, the the orbital information is in the <laughs> abbreviated like JF dynamically new. You know, See but that's all. Yeah, there's no direct correlation, as Maria but said. Slide. Maybe this is where you, yeah, had mentioned of CO to CO2 abundance ratios to just the second point. Yeah, oh, no, second the third, and third. Point. Yes, the second. third point. Well, actually, all of these are kind okay. of interesting in, in terms yes, of they are. Uh, um, where these guys came from and how much carbon was there and what has happened to it. Yes. Um, but it sounds like we need some more data points. To flesh this out. I think we need some more data points, and we need yeah. to look hard, frankly, again, at the chemistry going on in the protostellar nebula, but also in the coma, to make oh. sure we know uh -huh. what we're seeing. Uh -huh. uh, and the data are driving that, finally, I think. Um, it, it's Right now, it's kind of like saying, well, they're all kind of consistent with having formed in the oh. same neighborhood. Or maybe not exactly the same neighborhood, but over say five to ten AU uh -huh. possibly, and that that beyond that, I don't know what we can say. Right. Interesting. We'll learn a lot just by looking at the carbon. There are other molecules right. to look at. Oh yeah. For a lot of other atomic species. It, it was a challenge to, to not allow myself to mention nitrogen. It's a different workshop. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Well, thank you. Would you like to um, yeah, take it from here? Oh, a little piece of paper. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, so next uh, we 